So as we know, um, many things in nature that are based on, on chance, probability, when we randomly select people from a population, if we measure a numerical variable for those people, whatever it is, age, weight, BMI, or something like that, um, it's, no, it's often normally distributed. Normally distributed really just means that uh, uh, the distribution, uh, 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 the value for any individual random person you would pick out is based on just probability and chance. So in other words, um, if we're looking at BMI in the United States, I'm going to say the average BMI in the United States is 26. I'm making that number up. I'm going to say mu, and it's for the whole population, mu is equal to 26. And I'm going to say the standard deviation for BMI is equal to, I'm going to call it 5, for argument's sake. Okay, so I know that uh, uh, since this is the average, what that suggests, if it's really a normal distribution, it's not like ridiculously skewed to one side or the other. If it's a normal distribution, then typically what I would say is half of the people in this population are below the mean and half of the people are above the mean, right? And if I were to pick one person at random from this population, I'd have a 50-50 chance picking somebody from below and what somebody from above, okay? So I can, I can look at it that way. I can also look at it from, uh, in terms of number of people or in terms of probabilities. Half the people are below the mean, half the people are above the mean, right? Because usually in a normal distribution, you'd say the mean, the median, and even the mode, if, we, if it really is ideal, even the mode are really the same thing. So now, since we know the empirical formula, and since we have a, we, we have a formula that describes probability, this, this distribution in probability, it had a little some, some uh, natural logarithms in it. it, had all sorts of interesting things, but all we cared about that was that it gave us a function that allowed us to figure out how much area of this distribution was represented by different values on the x-axis, okay? And that was summarized into a z-table, right? Or uh, in Excel, it was summarized into a function called norm s dist, or norm dist. There's another version of it that you could use also. And the only difference between these two versions is that they both give you a p-value, probability that someone will be selected from that area, and they both represent a probability to the left of whatever number that you're looking at. And when I say number, it could be a BMI, like 25, or it could be the z-score that represents the number 25, right? That's really on the z-table, we're looking at the z-score, right? So this one, you put in the z-score, it gives you the area to the left of the, that value for the z-score. Uh, norm s this, you give it the mean, you give it the number that you're looking for, you give it the standard deviation, you type it true, and it gives you that same area. You don't have to calculate the z-score on your own. So that's the way we work with the normal distribution and with a population. That's great, except this is pie in the sky. Here's a pie. Now you have a whole bunch of sections, apple pie maybe. That's pie in the sky. We never really know the mean, the standard deviation for the entire population, right? The only time that happens is in the census, and that only happens once every 10 years, and that's a very limited survey of people. Okay, so, um, uh, uh, so in terms of normal distribution, in terms of normal distribution of empirical formula, if I were to ask you in this particular situation, what's the probability that uh, uh, if you randomly selected a person from this population, that their uh, uh, that their uh, that that value that value of x for that person, his BMI is equal to 31. Okay, which would be up here somewhere. What's the probability that well not equal to 31, but what's the probability that it would be 31 or less, right? In other words, up to 31. Okay. Well, in order to calculate this area we would need to calculate what the z-score that represents the number 31 is. And we can calculate that z-score is just the number of standard deviations. We can look at this and see that it's five more than the mean, so it's one standard deviation. The z-score is equal to one, it's equal to plus one. It's on the right-hand side of the mean, so it's a plus. If it had been, if it had been uh, 21, it would have been over here, Right, and it would have been on the left side of the mean, and 20, 21 would have been uh, uh, one standard deviation to the left, and it would have been a z score equal to minus one. Okay, right now it's equal to plus one.
Okay, so if we need to, if, if it's an odd number, an uneven number, you can calculate it by saying X, the value you're interested in, minus the mean over the standard deviation. Okay, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it for our value 31. So it's equal to 31 minus 26 over 5 is equal to 1, standard deviation of 1. So now I can go to my Z table. And look up the area that's represented to the right, to the left rather, of the z score of one. Well, this is all negative ones. That's why they're it's so far over. The second table is all the positive values from zero on up. And if a z score is equal to 1.00, it represents an area of 84.13% or 0.8413. So this area from here down is 0.8. 413. So the probability of selecting an individual from this population who has a BMI less than 31 is 84%, basically. Okay. What's the probability of selecting someone that has a the probability of selecting someone that has a BMI that's uh, greater than uh, 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 31? Well, it's going to be the area that's left here, right? This whole area represents 100% of the population. Since this was 84% of the population, well, this is going to be one point. Zero 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 minus point eight four one three four. Let's see one uh, one five seven eight one five nine seven one five eight seven. Does that look right? Okay. No, I'm sorry. Uh, eight four. Yeah, eight four. Yeah, yeah carry one, carry one. Yeah, that looks right. Okay. So so that's how we would use this. You know, and the homeworks on the on, on the exam, we may we complicated it a little bit by maybe we asked you what's the area between a z score or a value or a z score of negative 0.5 to plus one, and you had to calculate this area in here. And all you had to remember was that using your z table, you can find out a lot about this stuff. So for instance, that would involve say taking that 8413, and since you're looking for this area in here. And, and 8413 represents the whole area. All you had to do is find the z, z score and the percentage that's represented from that value down, 0.5 z score down, and subtract that from the 8413, leaving the area behind that you're interested in between these two values. Okay? Is that okay? All right? Should make some sense, right? Let me just make sure I want to check the chat box online. Okay, you guys are, are you guys comfortable with that uh, so far? By the way, you can you can uh, uh, if you want you can you can chat. There's two ways for you to type in the chat box. One is to uh, you know just broadcast everybody, which is great because then they'll know why, what question I'm answering. Or you can also you know send a chat to me privately if you want. Um, so at any rate, so yeah, so now we've complicated things. That that was nice, but it's very theoretical because we're dealing with the population and knowing the mean, knowing the standard deviation. Okay, so in real life, almost always the only thing we know about the population is what we can infer, right? That's why they call it inferential statistics. What we can infer from a sample that we take about the population. So let's take that population I was just looking at. Okay, the mean is uh, 26, the standard deviation is equal to five, if we take repeated samples from this population, and for instance, I take one sample, uh, I'm going to take a sample of size 9. Take repeated samples from this population. Uh, 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 one, time, one time I might get a value of 23, another time 27, right? Take, take nine people randomly, what's the average? 27. Take nine people randomly, what's the average? Uh, 26. Take nine people randomly, what's the average? 24. If we take many, 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 many samples of size nine, and now we plot them in a new distribution. That new distribution of sample means, sample means has its own, its own uh, 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 values, its own statistics, okay? And for instance, because half the time we're going to get values above, half the time we're going to get values below, uh, even when we take samples of size nine and we plot that, plot those sample means, 
it's going to be a normal distribution also. And the middle of it, the average value for these sample means, is going to be the same as the average value for the population. So if I took a thousand samples of size nine, I would expect to get the same mean for those sample means as I got for the population means, which in truth, I don't really know what that is. Okay, so the main difference here though is, is that because I'm taking a sample and averaging them, well, now I'm not gonna have a situation where I have where the number is going to be as small as the as lowest value for one person here in the population or the lowest value for th the three lowest people in the population worst case it's going to average nine people some of them are going to be down low some of them are going to be down high so these numbers are going to be closer together than random sam people sampled from the population and so that means since they're going to be closer together not spread out as far they're going to have a different standard deviation than the population mean. And the standard deviation for these sample means is going to be equal to the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. Okay, so I'm, we're assuming that we know the population standard deviation. That's another thing we don't know well, but I need to hang on to that for a while because I don't want to I don't want to have introduce too many variables right now. I want the only thing that I don't know to be the mean right now. Right, so that's population standard deviation. Well, you know something, I got a problem here. I'm calling this the standard deviation. I'm calling this the standard deviation. This represents standard deviation of population. This represents standard deviation of the sample means. Instead of calling standard deviation, I'm gonna call it standard error. You and I know it's the standard deviation of the sample means, but it's called standard error instead. So that standard error tells me what the spread of this population is. And that tells me that 95% of the time, I will get a mean, if I take a sample of size nine from here, I will get a mean between one, two standard deviations below the mean and two standard deviations above the mean. Why? Because you remember the empirical rule told us 95% of the, of, of the uh, outcomes are going to be between two standard deviations below and two standard deviations above. That happened to be an estimate. The real number is 1.96 standard deviations above and 1.96 standard deviations above. Okay, 95% of the outcomes are going to be. So in practice, we're never going to take a thousand samples of size nine, or a thousand samples of size 25 or a thousand samples of size 1,000. We're gonna take a single sample. And when we take that single sample, let's say I take a, a sample of size 20, um, 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 what was the standard deviation? So let's say I take a sample of size 25 from this population, right? And I get a mean, I'm gonna call it X bar because it's a sample, 25 people. Uh, I, I'm gonna say X bar comes out to be 27. Okay, well, that's nice. But if I tell someone, oh, you know, uh, I just did an analysis. I took a sample, 25 people, and the sample mean turned out to be 27. Oh, that's great. Uh, uh, that means the population mean is 27. No, it doesn't. It means that that sample you took has a mean of 27. You don't know what the population mean is really. So, oh, okay. Well, how, how accurate is that? How am I going to express how accurate that result is for a sample of size 25. Well, we can't really say how accurate it is in terms of, you know, oh, well, it's, it's like, an, uh, it's exactly right, or it's off by two or something like that. What we can do is take advantage of the way that we know samples are distributed and say that, you know, if we got a sample mean of, tw of 27, Right? We can expect 95% of the time we're within two standard deviations of the true mean of this population when we take a sample, right? So, you know, I'm gonna say that, I'm gonna work that the other way around. I'm gonna say, well, we got a sample mean of 27, but that means that the true population mean is between, is, is, an, is, a, is a value that's between two standard deviations, we call it standard errors, remember it's the standard deviation for the samples, two standard errors to the left minus and to the right, except that again, 1.96 is the real number. 
So what we can say is, is that when we take a sample of 25 people from this population and get a mean, that we can predict, if we know the population standard deviation, we can predict that we're 95% sure that the real population mean is going to be between 1.6 standard deviations below the mean and 1.96 standard deviations above the mean. So what is that in this case? In this case, it's 27 plus or minus 1.96. Now I got to calculate standard error is equal to, is equal to sigma over the square root of uh, the sample size is equal to 5 over 25 uh, over the square root of 25 is equal to 1. Square root of 25 is 1, 5 over 5 is 1. Okay, so that's equal to 1. So the value of standard error is equal to 1. So my, my, uh, uh, my range of values where I expect the true population mean to be is between 27 plus or minus 1.96 times 1, or in other words, 25.04 to 28.96. So when someone asks you, when you tell someone, oh, I took a, a 20, sample of 25 people from this population, turns out that the mean that I got was 27. Well, how well do you know what the true population mean is? Well, I don't really know the true population. But what I can tell you that I'm 95% certain that it's between 25.04 and 28.09. So let's define a couple of terms here. Because we're 95% certain it's between these two numbers, we call that the 95% confidence interval for the mean. Okay, um, and not only that, but you know, now that I think about it, uh, remember there was also the the uh, there, there were also rules and z-scores for you know, like 99% and so on and so forth. Let's say I'm looking at 99%, right? Well, what I can do is I could go to the z-table. And I could look up how far from the mean in z-scores do I have to be to represent a range that would capture 99% of this population or of this distribution, of any distribution, really, right? What, that, what would that z-score have to be? Well, it turns out if you go to the, the table, remember, that means, that means in order to have 99% in the middle, it means you have to have half a percent here and half a percent on the upper end. So I'm really looking for 0 0.005. So I'm going to I'm going to do the bottom end, 0 0.005, 0 0.005. Uh, let's see where is that? Here you go. It's right around here. I'm going to use this one. It's halfway between these, I'm going to use this one. Right. And what is that value? It's 2.58 standard deviations. Would represent five uh, half a percent on this end, and since it's symmetrical. That would also account for half a percent on this end. So 99% uh, uh, confidence now for capturing the mean is going to be 2.58 standard deviations to the left and 2.5 standard deviations to the right. You can still be wrong, but the chances of you cap having to come up with a sample that's outside that range is only 1%. Half a, half a percent chance you'd be too low, half a percent chance you'd be too high. So I could just redo this. And I could say instead that my confidence interval is, is X bar plus or minus, instead of 1.96, 2.58 times my standard error, which is equal to one. So what is that? That's 27 plus or uh, 26, I think, right? 26. Oh, I said 27 here. Yeah, you know, okay, let's go with 20. Oh, yeah, my sample is 27. Right, my sample. My sample is 27. X bar is 27. My sample mean for those for sampling 25 people, plus or minus 2.58 times one. Right, so that's going to be 20. Uh, let's see, 24.42 to uh, 29.58. I am 99% sure. In other words, my 99% confidence interval is this range here, these two numbers. Okay, now think about this. If you want to be 99, if you want to be able to say you're 99% sure that you've captured the population mean, should your confidence interval be wider or narrower? It's got to be wider because the wider it is, the more certain that you had captured it. Imagine this, if I told you that the BMI was zero to, zero to 100, 
right? That's a, that's a confidence interval about 100 because there's nobody that's going to be lower or higher. So the wider it is. And that's, and this using this number for your z score, right? That causes the interval to be wider, right? If I only, if I'm willing to be only 90% certain, I use, I can look up 5% on one end, 5% on the other. That turns out to be a z score of 1.64. So your confidence interval to be 90% sure is going to be 27 plus or minus 1.64 times my standard error, which is 1. So this difference, subtracted from 27 and added 27, is going to be a narrower range. So you can, you can express it as a narrower range, but you're, you, you're low, you have less confidence. You're only 90% sure you captured the true population. Okay? okay? Are you okay with that? Okay, good. Yes. Uh, precision is well. Yeah. Well, you, you, remember, this is inference. We're 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 not physicists now, right? Physicists, scientists, they're interested in accuracy and precision. In most cases, the way you look at that is if you step on a scale, right? If you step off, step on, step off, step off, step on, right? But and it reads the same thing all the time. That's precision. Accuracy is whether or not really it's measuring your weight. Precision, and I'm not so sure that's a term we use much in statistics. Where we're more, yeah, in epidemiology, yeah, I guess you would use it to some degree. But we're more in the statistics here, we're more into like what we can infer, what level of confidence we have, what we can infer. So at any rate, so I have to look, I have to look that up. I have to look up uh, what, how, you know, how, uh, how precision and accuracy are used in epidemiology. But I usually associate those terms with engineering and, and the other side, and, and the, and the, and the uh, uh, what do they call them? The uh, physical sciences, rather than, rather than statistic, which is the mystical science, one of the mystical sciences, right? Okay, so at any rate, at any rate, um, uh, you know what Mark Twain said about statistics, right? Right, he says, there's lies, there's big lies, and there's statistics, so. Okay, so at any rate, at any rate, are we online? Are we okay with that? Do we feel oh, do we feel comfortable with what we've done so far? Great. Okay, good. So we can move on from there. Okay, so now obviously the sample size changes, the standard error changes. So take a look at this. Bigger bigger sample size, the standard error is smaller. So you're adding and subtracting a smaller number. You're multiplying 1.96 times a smaller number which means you're adding and subtracting a smaller number. So you can shrink your confidence interval by having a bigger sample size. That makes sense, right? You're more confident when you got a bigger sample size. Okay, and, and just one more term, define, well, let's define one more term. This term that we add and subtract from the, uh, uh, our value for the mean of our sample, uh, whether it's for 90% confidence or whether it's for 90% confidence, we call that term the margin of error. So, so we have a few terms that we've learned. Okay, the important ones are standard error and, and margin of error, I think, for now. Okay? So now let's take a look at where we can take this from here. Okay. So I gave you an example where we talked about a numerical variable, a mean. Let's take a look at a binomial variable. Right? Binomial variable is dichotomous. It has two values. Right? So, for instance, it comes up a lot in public health, right? Person has a disease, person doesn't have the disease. Person has been treated, he took a drug, uh, took a placebo. Right? It comes up quite a bit. Um, uh, uh, you may remember that uh, uh, when we were looking at uh, uh, coin flips, that uh, 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 the uh, or even remember that machine we were looking at. We had the video of that of that machine uh, over at the Queens Museum, the Gal Galton machine, right where the balls would come down. They hit the little little uh, uh, bars and they would bounce one way or the other. And then at the bottom they would accumulate. And and 50% of the time, the, the most the, the most common outcome is 50% of the time it would go left 10 times and right. Excuse me, left five times, right five times, and wind up in the middle. But sometimes you go left six times and right four, 
So it would wind up next to it and, and so on and so forth. So it formed almost a normal distribution, right? So we're going to come back to that in a second because binomial distributions are very frequently there described as proportions instead of averages. So for instance, if I were to tell you that in a population, okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call the population proportion P. Let's say the population proportion is equal to, uh, 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 let's say coin flips. If I clipped, flipped a million coins, half the time they would be heads, half the time they would be tails. So the probability of getting heads would be 0.5. On any given toss, 50% chance I would get heads. So, uh, but a lot of times I would get, if, if, I, if, I, if I took a sample now and I flipped the coin 10 times, right? Well, if I flipped the coin 10 times, sometimes I would get five, sometimes I get four, sometimes I get six, and so on and so forth. Well, let's apply this to a situation where we're measuring a proportion. Let's say that we sample a population of uh, senior citizens, okay, in Florida. Okay, and they're uh, 65 years or older, and uh, we'll, we'll narrow it down a little bit. This, our population is going to be, uh, uh, they're going to be self-sufficient, right? They're living on their own. Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, they don't have any significant health problems, da, 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 so on and so forth. And we, uh, we, sample, um, uh, uh, we sample them. We sample, say, uh, uh, 500 of them. And we do a survey and we ask them, how many of you have had a fall in the last 12 months? Right? And we get our answers. And uh, of the 500 people that we sample, let's say 150 say yes, and 350 say no. What proportion has had a fall? 150 out of 500 of these seniors have had a fall. So the probability of having a fall in this sample is 150 over 500, or it's 30%, 0.30. Okay, so, okay, that's great. The only problem is, is that this is not really the population proportion, because there might be in Florida, I understand you move to Florida and you live forever. That's what they tell me, right? So at least that's what's in the ads, right? So, so, so th that might be not, this might be a pretty big population. This might represent 2 million people. How many did I sample? I only sampled 500. So the proportion I'm describing here is a proportion of my sample that had a fall in that period of time right? Not the population. So I'm going to distinguish it by, remember I, I put X bar, I put a bar over the X to distinguish this from the, po the sample mean from the population mean, which I call mu. Well, in the case of proportions, I'm going to put a little cap on the P, right? And call that P cap. That represents, when you see that, you know I'm talking about the sample proport a sample proportion, a sample of size 500. So now, I'm going to say to myself, okay, so I got a, I have a quadri here. P, the true population proportion, is unknown. I took a sample of 500. The, po the proportion of 500 people that I uh, surveyed or tested came out to be 30%. But now I have to describe how well do I know that 30%? How accurately? How, 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 I, how can I describe... Uh, 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 what the true population proportion is in terms of what I know from that sample. Okay, and we're going to do exactly the same thing we're going to do, we did before. We're going to take P cap, we're going to add and subtract two standard deviations, 1.96 times the standard error for this proportion. Well, what do, I, what do I mean standard error? Well, just like the mean, when we took sample of size 25, we got a number, took another sample size 25, took another sample size 25. That distribution of results had a, a, a width, a range that we described as the standard error. Instead of calling it standard deviation, we called it standard error, but it's really a standard deviation. So we need a standard error or deviation for if we took repeated samples of size 500 and calculated a proportion. 
sometimes it's going to, so let's say the population proportion was really 0 0.332, right? Sometimes we get 0.31, sometimes you get 3, 0.37, sometimes the average would wind up being 0.32 if we took it enough times, but, but, uh, uh, but, we, but we don't have the resources to do that, of course, and we don't have the resources to test everybody. So we don't know what that true population proportion is. So we need to describe what we think the true population, what the standard error is without knowing this sigma here. And we're going to do that by using two rules. We're going to say to ourselves, we can use a formula to estimate what the standard error is equal to. And that formula is going to be the square root of P times 1 minus P times N, the sample size. Okay. So let's see what that means. What, what is that going to mean to me? Oh, I'm sorry. Divided by n. I knew right away it had to be it had to be on the bottom, right? Why do I know it has to be on the bottom? Because as the sample size gets bigger, we want our standard error to be a smaller number, so we get a narrower range. That makes sense, right? Okay. So what is p and one minus p? Well, we don't know the population proportion, right? We really need to know the population proportion to be completely accurate and calculate the standard error. But unfortunately, we never know what the true population proportion is, just like we don't know what the true mean is. So we need a substitute for it. And the substitute we're going to use is P cap and 1 minus P cap. Okay? How can we justify doing that? Well, I know it introduces a little bit of an error because we don't really know what the true population standard deviation is. We don't know what the true proportion is in the population. This formula, this formula really is meant for the true population proportion, but we're never going to know it. So how can I justify using PCAP? The way we justify it is by only doing it if we have a large sample. Now, we could sit here all day and you can ask every biostatistics professor in the country, what do you consider a large sample? And you get a different answer from everybody, right? You know what they say about opinions, right? So, so at any rate... So you get a large, and so you, want, you get a large sample. For our purposes, a large sample is going to be a sample that gives you at least a size 15 for both sides of this proportion. In other words, there has to be at least 15 people who said yes and 15 people who said no, right? So we're well above that. We're at 150 and 350. We have no problem with that, right? Um, uh, uh, so, so. So our, our sample size is sufficient for what we need to use this formula. Obviously, the bigger the sample size is, the more confident you are anyway. Uh, so P denotes both population proportion and probability. Yeah, it does. Uh, it, it, it denotes just like, X, just like uh, the mean. Uh, oh, excuse me, I, I, it's not a good example. P represents, uh, P without a cap, right, represent the proportion of the people that are have had a fall or could represent the proportion of people that have diabetes in this population, right? And that's the same thing as saying, what's the probability that if you pick one person randomly out of this population that they have diabetes or they've taken a fall? In this case, uh, uh, if, if we knew what P was, we don't know what it is, right? We're guessing at it. If we knew that P was 0.45, that would mean 45% of the population has that condition. And it would also mean that if I took a random sample of one person from that population, the probability of having that having that condition is 45%, right? Makes sense because if 45% of people have it, you know, if 50% of the people have it, it'd be a toss up whether you got a person with the condition or not. So yeah, you could look at it that way. So, okay, so let's see, let's see what happens now with PCAP. This is the result that we got from a sample of size 500, right? 150 yeses, 350 noes. So P cap is equal to 0 0.30, that's 150 over 500, plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error. Standard error here is going to be equal to the square root. Let me bring this out here. The square root of, well, P, is, P cap is 0.3 times 1 minus 0.3 is 0.7 over 500. Okay, so we're going to calculate everything that's in there and then take the square root of it. Uh, make sure this is all clear. So 0.3 times 0.7, oops, 
point three times point seven equals point two one divided by five hundred equals point zero 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 etc. And we're going to take the square root of that. The square root of that is point zero two. Uh, I'm just going to call it point zero two zero point zero. I'm just going to call it point zero two for our purposes, right? So my standard error is equal to point zero two. So I'm going to move this standard error into here, 0 0.02. So, oops, 0 0.02. So my 99% confidence interval, 95% uh, confidence interval for the true population uh, the population proportion that's that it had a fall in the past year is going to be 0 0.30 plus or minus 1.96 times times 0 0.02 is 0 0.02. Three, nine, two. Is that right? I think that's right. Right. Might as well do it. Might as well do it with the calculator. Times point. Ah, I'm gonna have to clear that. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna put point uh, point three. Point three. I'm gonna put that into memory. There we go. Okay, and I'm gonna clear that. And I'm going to say, uh, da, da, da. I should have put the other one into memory. Let me clear that again. Let's see, 1.96 times 0 0.02 equals 0 0.0392, or a little bit under 0 0.04. I got it right. What do you know? Okay, uh, I'm going to put that into memory. I'm going to clear this. And I'm going to take, that's our margin of error now, right? We're, calling, we're going to call that our margin of error from now on. So I'm going to take our 0.3 and subtract our margin of error, and that's equal to 0.26, and I'm going to clear that, and I'm going to take uh, uh, 0.3 and subtract and add our margin of error. And that's going to be equal to 0.339. <clears throat> right so we're nine we took a sample of 500 people turned out that the 150 out of 500 uh had uh had a fall during the past year the probability of having a fall during the past year for the entire population we're guessing we think is around 30 percent 0.3 right but based on the sample size and our proportion in this population we're estimating that the true p for the population the true population proportion for all 2 million people was that between 26% and 34% of them had a fall during that course of that 12 months. Okay, that's the way we, that's the difference in the way that we use it. Just like before, if we're interested in the 99% confidence interval for the true proportion, we would just substitute 2.58 for 1.96. If we're interested in a 90% confidence interval, we use 1.64 instead of 1.96 for the not for the z score that we're using for our confidence interval okay there's a strange twist on this which i'm going to show you i think i might have given you a problem like this on the homework i'm not even not even sure right now but i think i may have so i want to go over this and it came up uh, at least one of you brought this up as a question there's another way you could look at these proportions i'm going to take exactly the same uh, uh, situation that we had here and I'm going to say that uh, 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 we take a sample of 500 people. We get a uh, uh, 150 of them ha have had a fall. So our probability P cap is equal to 30%, percent point three. Okay, so, you know, I say to myself, gee, okay, that's interesting. That's what I think it is. Now, how many people does that represent? Well, point three times P, in other words, N times p cap that's equal to that's equal to 500 times 0.3 that's 150 which is just the way i started right so i'm going to assume that if you take a sample of 500 then you you could say that if i i'm going to assume for a minute that that proportion is true that's the correct true population proportion right it's a big assumption but you know we're going to make it for a moment 
I'm going to say it's a true population proportion. You could say to yourself, I can draw based on this, I can draw a, a normal distribution. And in this normal distribution, the number of people out of 500, out of a sample size of 500, the number, average number of people that I would find that had a fall would be 150. So my mean X bar for the number of people that have a fall can be expressed as a sample size times the proportion of the sample that I got, 150, right? Well, that's interesting. So now I want to calculate a, let's say I want to, uh, it looks kind of like a normal distribution. You want to know something? No, it's not really a normal distribution. It's what they call a normal approximation for a binomial distribution. distribution okay, it's a, it's approximate it's not really truly a normal a, a standard z-score type normal distribution but it's close so what does this do for us well if i can come up with a standard deviation that i can use or a standard error standard deviation or a standard error that i can use i'm kind of simulating the population here if i can come up with a, a standard error for this i can make predictions just like I did before, like what percentage of the population is two stand, below two standard deviations away from the mean? What percentage is more than one standard deviation above the mean? In fact, that standard deviation can be approximated by the square root of n times p times one minus p. See, this is the reason why I got a little, remember I, got, I had a little bit of hitch there when I made the other formula, because there is another formula for this situation. Right, so let's see what that comes out to be here. It's the square root of 500 times 0.3 times 0.7. Okay, so what does that standard deviation come out to be? Clear. Let's clear everything here. So that's 500 times 0.3 times 0.7. Okay, that's 105, 105, and then I'm going to take the square root of that, and the square root of that is a little bit more than 10, 10 point, I'm going to call it 10.2, okay, it's equal to 10.2. Okay. That's my standard deviation. So now, if you ask me, uh, Tony, if I take a sample of size, uh, 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 if I take a sample of size 500, right, this only applies to that sample size, right, because that's what we would working with. If I take a sample of size 500, again, if I take a new sample of size 500, what's the probability that we would get between, that we would get fewer, less than um, 120 people out of that 500 that had a fall that year? Oh, well, now I can calculate a z-score. The z-score for this value 120 is let's see it's going to be equal to x minus mu over sigma proper standard deviation is going to be equal to 120 minus 150 over sigma which was what i just got 10.2 okay so let's see what that comes out to be approximately approximately three right okay so actually you want to know something i don't want to use i'm going to change that number because it's such a small number I'm going to make it, I'm going to make this one, 135. Okay, so I make this 135. Uh, so it's going to be 15 over 10.2. What's that? Okay, so let me calculate this. Clear, clear, clear. Uh, 15 divided by 10.2 is equal to a z-score of 1.47. So my z-score is minus 1.47 to the left side. If I want to know what percentage of, what's the probability that I would ran, take 500 people, ask them if they had a fall, and I would get 100, less than 120 of them telling me in that sample of 500 that they had a fall, what's the probability that that would occur? Okay, well, let's see. What that's going to be, we're going to need our, our uh, table, one point, negative 
negative 1.4 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 is about 7%. I'm just going to round it 7%. 0. 0.07. So this area, uh, 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 but don't round like that, please. Round at the very end. If you have to at all, don't round at all. Okay, don't, do as I say, not as I do. I'm just doing that because I, I would have put the other two numbers in here. Uh, uh, or at least maybe carried a third digit or something like that. 0. 0.07. So 7% of the time, you would get a result if you took a sample of 500. Uh, Seven percent of the time, you would find a result where you had 135 people or fewer that uh, 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 that were in that group of 500 that had a fall. Yeah, how do you know when to use this? You got to read the problem. In other words, for instance, if I gave, if I asked you, what's the probability that uh, if you took a sample of size 120? That you would get a result less than uh, you know one uh, less than 135, right? You say to yourself, well, gee, how am I going to? I can't, you know, with the other thing, I can calculate the proportion and the mean, but uh, and the confidence interval, but it doesn't give me a value for the exact the number of people. It only gives you proportions, right? It doesn't give me a value for the number of people out of 500. So if we start talking about asking the the actual number of people. Chances are we're looking at asking for normal approximation to, to the binomial distribution. Remember, I told you this was only an approximation. If you want to do the, if you want to know what it is exactly, you have to use the binomial equation. Remember that it was a really nasty equation. Okay, let me, let me see if I can't find it quickly. Oh, spinning beach ball. Binomial equation. See if you can't find it real quick. There it is right there. See it there? So you would have to say N, that's 500 factorial over 500 minus whatever that value is, and you know, 135 uh, factorial times uh, 135 factorial, uh, 135 times 134, and so on and so forth, times P, 0.3 to the 150th pat, you know, it's, it's got to be a pain in the butt. So why do we, we don't use that typically? What we do is we go to a, a, a calculator that will allow us to do it, online calculator, or you can even just pull up Excel and use the binomial distribution. Okay, I'm going to blow this up a little bit. Okay, make this meeting even bigger. Okay, equals binome dist. This parentheses. And what does it want? It wants the value of x that I'm interested in. That was 135. Comma, the number of trials is 500. Comma, the probability of any individual in this population having a fall. That was 0.3, I think. Did I keep a 0.3 for this? I don't remember. I did keep it a 0.3, comma. And if I say true, it will give me the probability of taking a sample of size 500 and getting a result of 135, 134, 133. It'll give me all those results. And it comes out to be a little bit more than 7%, right? Did I get, which of these two is more exact? This one's more exact, right? Because it's presumably Excel used that formula to calculate all the real possibilities. But if we didn't have that available to us, it's nice to be able to have a way of approximating it in a way that we worked with the normal distribution before. Yeah, I, you know, I, I we just uh, uh, that just got mentioned here as well, that how do you decide which one of these that you're going to use, right? Well, it's really in the in the way that the question is phrased. phrased. If I were to ask you for a confidence interval for a proportion, if I told you that we took a sample of, three, uh, of uh, 350 people and uh, 100 of them are voting Democratic, and you wanted to know, well, you know, uh, what does that tell us? Is, what's the true population proportion of people that are voting Democratic? Well, true population proportion, what they're asking for me is what's the p-value? In other words, What's the probability 
in other words, if 350, what did I say? Whatever I said before, yeah, if, uh, I'm going to change it to 1,000. Let's say it's going to be easier for me to get my head around. Let's say that I told you four, five, 550 people out of 1,000 said they were going to vote Democratic. And you ask me, well, what's the true population proportion? How well do you know that? How accurately? How accurately? How precisely? Maybe. I don't know. I don't like using that word too much in statistics. But how well do you know that? Oh, well, in this case, 550 out of 1,000, it looks like 55% of this population are going to vote Democratic. But, you know, I don't really know that for sure. I only know that my proportion was 55% for this sample population, right? So what I can do with that is I can calculate a, uh, uh, a confidence interval for the true population proportion, P cap plus or minus 1.96 times my standard error, square root of P times one minus B over N, right? If I instead had asked you, well, what's the probability in this same situation? What's the probability if you take another sample of a thousand, right? What's the probability that you would get uh, 500 or fewer people who say they vote Democratic. Ah, well, in that case, you're looking for a number of people, right? So, or per a percentage of people that would vote. Let, uh, that, uh, you would, you're looking for the percentage of time less than 500 people would vote, not the percentage of time that you would get a percentage less than half, but the number of people is less than half. Right, it's a, a distinction, right? So 500 out of 1,000, you're looking for uh, uh, that proportion. So in that case, you would be looking to apply the uh, binomial approximation. So you would say, uh, well, our our normal number, that the average that we would expect to get is 550. How often will you get 500? Well, if 550 is my mean, let me calculate a standard error square root of n times p times 1 minus p. Use that standard error to figure out what the z-score for 500 is. How far is 500 really from 550? And then say, well, the area to the left of 500 is this amount. This is what percentage of the time, if we took 1,000 people, that we'd get 500 or fewer. So it's really in the phrasing of the problem, right? I hope that helps. You know, so I was a little reluctant even to bring this. I, you know, I'm kind of, did I put this in one? Was that one of the homework problems? Did, I, did that make it a little bit clearer? Yes? Okay. Did that make it a little bit clearer? Somebody asked me to take a look at another problem here. Assignment four, I think one and two. Let me just take a quick look at this. See what I posted here. Limit theorem. Begin. Okay. I'm going to pause this for a second so I can go back to the email and see exactly what the question was. Problem 11 and 12, okay. Okay, 11 and 12. Oh, that's exactly what we're talking about. Probability of the staff with the standard deviation. Oh, it's got, no, it's confidence interval. Uh, so it starts at 10. Starts at 10. 
probability an infant is born prematurely in Mexico is 0.15. What is the standard error for the proportion of premature births for repeated samples from this population of size 25? Right, it's going to be p times 1 minus p over n. Take the square root of the whole thing. I just phrased, I wrote it out here the way that you would put it into Excel. So you have the uh, all the parentheses correct. So I am going to calculate that for this problem. So for this problem, uh, the standard error is going to be 0.15 times 0.85. divided by the sample size, 25, equals this, okay. And uh, then I take the square root of that, and I get 0.07. I'm going to call that 7%. We would expect the 95% confidence interval of the, of, oh, okay, that's a separate problem, okay. It's the same problem as above, except we gave it a new sample size. Now, yeah, you know, I, I should rephrase this i should re point out that we're talking about the same population uh, mexico same population but we increased the sample size so so th this is the right answer for question 10. but now for question 11 it's asking for a 95 percent confidence interval uh, 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 so let's assume that we got the same result which is 0.15 and we can't see what you're writing on the screen. And we would expect that 95% of the time, we would get a result between 1.96 standard deviations below what P is and 1.96 standard deviations above what P is, if we take a sample of size 625. So let's, let's calculate. Uh, what am I all clear about? All clear, okay. Okay, so let's calculate that. So it's going to be 0.15 times 0.85 uh, 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 divided by n, which is 625. Divide, uh, take the square root of that, and it comes out to be 0.014. So our standard error is, point, is a proportion of 0.014. So we would expect 95% of the time, if we took a sample of size 625 in this population, we would expect the range of proportions, 95% of the time, to be between to be between 0.15 plus or minus 1.96 times 0 .01, 0 0.0142. If I double that, it's about 0 0.02, about 3%. So it's going to be roughly 0.15 plus or minus about 3%, about roughly 12% to 18%. So you would actually calculate that out a little bit more carefully. We would expect 95% of population samples of size. Oh, and, and this is the lower range minus, and this is the upper range plus. You know, I'll, I'll reword that a little bit so it's a little bit clearer. Oh, oh my goodness, I forgot to, I forgot to continue the screen. Okay, let me do that again since I froze the screen. Okay, so question 10 tells you that the true population proportion that an infant is born prematurely in Mexico is 15%. What's the standard error for repeated samples of size 25 from this population? Well, in this case, we know what the population proportion is. So in order to calculate standard error, we calculate P times 1 minus P over N and take the square root. So that's going to be 0.15 times 0.85 divided by 25, and we take the square root of that, and I, I forget what it came, came up to be something like 0.07 or something like that, but you can calculate that. Just work that out. Okay, in the second part here, we say, okay, same population as above, except what's, what, uh, what is the range within, if we took repeated samples of size 625, what's the range within within which we would expect 95% of the time the result of our sample of 625 to be, right? So that would be a confidence interval for 0.15, which is what we know the proportion to be, true proportion to be, plus or minus 1.96 for 95% times our standard error, except in this case, the standard error is based on the sample of 625. So it's going to be 0.5 times 
uh, uh, 0.85 divided by 625, take the square root of it, came out to be 0 0.014, right? And then we would multiply 0 0.014, the standard error, times 1.96 and add and subtract it from 0.15. So it's approximately 0.03 subtracted from 15, it's approximately 0.12 and uh, 0.15, uh, 0.3 added to 0.15, with uh, 0.15, which comes out to be 0.18, right? So this one you would put in the lower range, the 1.12, except more precisely, of course. And this one you would put in the upper range, the 0.18 or, or whatever it comes out to more precisely, okay? So uh, hopefully you being able to see the screen helped a little bit. I'm not sure if it did or not. But actually, I think we might have had this this up here, uh, this problem up here anyway before I before I uh, froze it. I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't remember. Okay, so so I understand that the proportion part of this is a little bit more dicey than you know because there's two ways you could look at this. One way is to calculate the uh, confidence interval for a proportion based on a sample, and the other way you're looking at uh, what the likely outcome is for a proportion in terms of the number of people that are successes versus the number of people that are not successes versus the number of trials really okay hopefully when you see the problem and you understand what they're asking for it'll it'll point you in the right direction okay so i think that's it for today i think we we uh that's a good time to bail out on this and uh i'll put up the recording tonight so if you guys want to go back over this, I'll put it up tonight. So I have to download it and put it on YouTube. Okay, guys. So good night.